Hi everyone, this is Ruth and today we are going to talk about the story of Slack. If you don't know what Slack is, then you probably haven't been employed in any kind of business that works online in recent years. Because Slack is one of the most popular messaging apps out there for businesses and for a very good reason. We have been using Slack for about a year and a half now. We've used Skype before that. And since moving to Slack, our life changed. And that kind of inspired me to check up on the story of Slack, how it was created, who the founders were, and how Slack became what it is today. And let me tell you, I was surprised. First of all, you should know that the Slack story is not a story of success. It's actually a story of failures and pivoting. And this is what we will talk about today. So without further ado, let's talk about Slack, the founder, and how it was created. And most importantly, what we can learn from that in our own business and our own SaaS companies. Let's jump into it. The founder of Slack is Stuart Butterfield. He was born in 1973 in Canada. Now, an interesting fact about Stuart is that it's not his real name. He changed his name to Stuart at the age of 12. I guess he knew about pivoting from a very early age. Slack was not the first company Stuart founded. At first, he started with the world of gaming. He created a game called Neverending Game. And while the name was Neverending, it really didn't kick off. The game was a failure. They couldn't get the traction that they needed and the game just didn't succeed to take off. But a part of the game was a social image sharing feature and Stuart decided to take this feature and kind of pivot the entire company and the entire product into a completely new product. And this is also a product you've probably heard of. Can you guess what it is? Flickr. Game never ending, failed, but Stuart created Flickr out of some existing features in the game. This is his first pivot, other than changing his name at 12. Flickr launched only three months after deciding to build it. One of the reasons was that a lot of the features already existed inside Neverending Game, and all they had to do was take these features and create something new with them. Another reason was probably the need to deliver fast. When you are pivoting after working on something for so long and not getting the traction you need from that, it is pretty motivating to launch something fast. Flickr was a success. Unlike Game Never Ending, Flickr actually managed to create the traction and revenue needed to sustain it as a company. And in 2005, it was sold to Yahoo for $25 million. So after selling Flickr and going out of the deal with 25 extra million dollars, I guess Stuart really wanted to get back into the online gaming niche. Maybe he was passionate about it, maybe he just believed in this niche, but the next thing he did was create a company developing a game named Glitch. Now Glitch had a little more success than Neverending Game, but still not enough. It had a few very loyal customers. And when I say a few, it is estimated to be around 100 customers who absolutely loved this game. They enjoyed it a lot. The rest were not very interested. So Glitch, while a little more successful, did not take off either. Just like Neverending Game, it's another failed game. Well, Stuart could basically just say, you know what, maybe I'm not built for that and leave. While working on Glitch, the company actually used some internal communication tools to communicate internally. Yeah, that's kind of obvious, Never mind. While working on Glitch, the company used a product called IRC to communicate internally. This was an instant messaging tool, but as many instant messaging tools and products at the time, it had one major issue. It was literally instant messaging. If you missed a message, if you were not online, for some reason or not in your computer to see it, you just missed it. There was no way to view messages later on like you would with SMS or anything like that. And because of this issue, the Glitch company developed some internal tools to help them communicate better. They created some messaging storing tools to sit on top of the IRC and actually save messages for later so that if you missed a message, you wouldn't have to never see it again. You can just log in once you're available and see all of your messages that you received when you were not online. In the end, all of these internal add-ons became more useful 
to the company than the actual tool they were built on. They started using these internal developments as their main methods of communicating. And when Glitch failed, Stuart had to make a decision. And the decision was to launch these internal communication tools as his new product. And the product's name is Slack. When Stuart decided on this pivot, he had to communicate it to his investors and they all had the chance to basically cut their losses and withdraw some of their money from the company. But 100% of them decided to stay. And boy, did they make a right decision. Slack was launched in 2009 and very recently, in July of 2021, it was sold to Salesforce for $27.7 billion. The success of Slack came from from solving a real life issue that people needed solved. You might have heard of Slack described as emails, DMs, and file sharing all in one. That's because instead of creating a completely new concept, and trying to kind of teach your customers that they need this new concept, what Slack did was take existing concepts and just improve on them, make them so much better that we all know we need internal communication in the workplace, but we didn't know we needed Slack until we had it because it just makes communications so much smoother. So let's talk about what we can learn from the journey of Slack, from the journey of Stuart Butterfield creating two failed games and two very successful products that are not games, that are not what he initially set up to do. What can we learn from him about failure and pivoting? The first thing you need to do is kind of detach yourself from being in love with your product. Stuart really wanted to create a game. I guess that's why he started two different game companies. But in the end, he made business decisions rather than emotional decisions. He realized that the games he was creating were not succeeding, so he found a way to make use of the company and the things that he've already worked on to actually succeed, rather than just burying his head in the sand and continuously digging himself into these games and trying to make them succeed without really thinking outside of the box. Second, we can learn about reusability of features and code. In both cases, Stuart didn't just say, okay, the game is not working, let's build something new. He took things he's already worked on that his team has already built and just created them into individual products. In Flickr's case, it was something that was a part of the game. It was a feature that was already in the game in the initial product. In Slack's case, it was something that they built for themselves, some backend communication tool for their own team that they decided to launch as a product. Third, they tried to find something that they can actually solve, a problem to solve with their existing features. In Flickr's case, they looked at the features that their existing customers are actually using and figured out that the file sharing one, the photo sharing one, is the most useful one. This is what their customers cared about. About. This is what they wanted. So they launched it as a product so that their customers can use it. And it worked. In Slack's case, they solved an internal problem for themselves and they figured out if they needed it, other companies might need it too. They were basically flexible about their niche, their audience, their problem solving. They didn't get stuck in the initial idea. They were open enough to find out other ways that they can be useful in the world and it paid off for them. As I said before, they didn't try to reinvent the wheel and create something completely new. They took existing concepts that customers have an easy way of understanding and just reframe them and repackage them into something that is way more useful. So that's an easy sell. You don't have to teach your customers a new concept and convince them that they need something that they didn't know they needed up until now. And most importantly, I think we can learn from the story of Slack and Flickr that failing doesn't mean failing until you give up. It just means that maybe you need to change your point of view and try to pivot your product, your business, your value statement. There are some mixed messages a lot of first-time entrepreneurs are hearing about pivoting and not getting stuck in something that doesn't work on the one hand and showing some grit and not just giving up because you failed on the other hand. This is very difficult to decide, should I pivot or should I just keep grinding until it works? I think the answer is kind of a little bit of both. It really depends on your situation. If you haven't given something enough time, enough attempts, then maybe you should stick to it until you see that it actually doesn't work, that you have acquired some customers and they continuously leave you and tell you, no, nah, I'm not interested, this is not good enough. Get feedback from your customers. And then if you figured out that your initial idea failed and it's not working, then yeah, pivot. Pivot! Pivot 
quitting doesn't mean giving up. It just means you're reframing some things so that you can actually make whatever you build successful. It might mean a completely different product and it might mean just changing some things, whatever it is your niche audience, some features, some capabilities. Some things need to change so that you reach product market fit. Actually, we had a conversational video talking about one of our products that failed its first launch and what we did to get it closer to product market fit. It's still in progress, but things are looking up. So if you want to watch it, I'm going to link it up. You can check it out. I think this is it as far as Stuart Butterfield and Slack. I feel like this video kind of grazes the surface of all the information out there about this person and his businesses, but I really wanted to focus on some actionable lessons we can learn from what he did with both of his companies. If you have any questions or if you're interested in hearing more case studies like this about companies that made it through failures, let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know, have you had a failure story like that? Did you ever try to create something that you thought was amazing and just couldn't get the traction you expected it to have? Let us know in the comments. We would love to hear from you. Have a great day and I will see you in the next video.